Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for the invitation to this lecture series. Uh, it's, of course, a pity that we cannot meet on site in Bonn, but I'm glad to have the, op the option to join you uh, via this video setting. So uh, the overarching theme of this lecture series has been inspired by Ulrich Beck's work on what he has called the metamorphosis of the world. According to Beck, climate change and other global challenges are drivers of a fundamental reconfiguration of contemporary societies, which are about to unsettle basic ordering principles of modernity. For example, nation states give way to worldwide cosmopolitan action spaces, which have made all of us global players, if we want this or not. At the same time, changes in society have become so closely entangled with changes in the global ecosystem, think of climate change, of course, that it is getting impossible to make any distinction between what is nature and what is society. In line with his earlier work on risk society, Beck interpreted this metamorphosis as a necessary consequence of modernization. According to Beck, we do not choose to metamorphize. The socially produced side effects of modernization, such as climate change, undermine established understandings and force us to think beyond the established frameworks of modernity. So as Beck notes, even the most docked nationalists can only be effective if they no longer restrict their horizon to their own country. Although Beck's diagnosis is quite deterministic, he describes metamorphosis as a process of creative action and reflexive learning. If established modern frameworks of thinking and acting are no longer capital, or capable to face the new challenges, then other frameworks have to be invented. And according to Beck, such frameworks emerge in historical processes of learning by doing. And they go hand in hand with what Beck describes as the transformation of cosmopolitan milieus that sustain these transformations. Beck's broad brush picturing of global metamorphosis, however, says very little about the settings and mechanisms through which such learning actually proceeds. His interest was more in the general direction of societal change and the challenges in it than on its situated dynamics. But this is precisely what I want to do in this lecture. I want to explore how a city, and my example is London, has become a space of collective learning and experimentation. I believe that cities are particular promising sites to look at if we are to understand the dynamics of socio-ecological learning. Cities are major causes of environmental problems. And they are also key in socio-ecological transformation. Moreover, with their social diversity and dynamics, cities form fertile breeding grounds, just of those cosmopolitan milieus which Beck considers as so important for socio-ecological learning. In one chapter of his book, Beck himself points to the increasing transnational cooperation between cities on climate change. He calls it cosmopolitan realpolitik. 
but he leaves open how socio-ecological transformation also occurs within the cities themselves. Within London, I want to study the political learning processes that have been involved in the rise of community-based food growing or urban agriculture. Urban agriculture has long been mainly associated with cities in the global south, but today it also figures on the public agenda of cities in North America and Europe. It is associated with a number of benefits, such as community building, care for urban green and biodiversity, and most importantly, the reduction of the negative environmental and health effects of large-scale industrialized food provisioning. One might probably see the concern for localizing food production as a countertrend to the cosmopolitanism that Beck discusses in his book. This, however, is only partly true. Urban agriculture is rooted in a concern about the global effects of unsustainable food provisioning. And urban agriculture initiatives around the world are also connected by a continuous exchange of knowledge and of ideas. Moreover, the rise of agriculture in the city is itself a telling example of how creative action challenges established frameworks of the modern period. Indeed, the absence of agriculture in current cities has been the result of the industrialization and modernist planning of cities which relocated farmings in the countryside. So it returns this historical process of modernity when we bring it now back to the city. And London can be seen as a pioneer in urban agriculture, both with respect to its early beginnings and because of the degree to which it is anchored in the local policy system. And what follows, I will trace how this agenda has taken shape in London, how it has gained traction, and how it has materialized in various community and public policy initiatives. Unlike other studies of urban agriculture, which have been primarily interested in critically evaluating its potential ecological and socio-political benefits, I'm interested in the processes of learning and knowledge making through which urban agriculture took shape as a doable and meaningful social activity. How was doing urban agriculture actually invented and shared as a common practice between people in London? I want to understand how the different actors who were involved in this process, citizens, planning experts, and policy makers, developed this common understanding of what food growing in the city is, but also why it is valuable to do that and how it can be promoted. My perspective is informed by recent works in the social studies of science and so-called social practice theory, a broader trend of sociological theories that uh, has been developed more recently. And such approaches understand learning not as a purely mental process of knowledge acquisition by an individual, but as a collective process of active sense-making and negotiation, which is embedded in a locally and historically specific learning environment. More concretely, my case study builds on a broadening interest in urban studies and what's called learning assemblages, urban experimentation, or also urban living laboratories. As for example, Bas van Hoer and Andy Carbon have argued, we are currently witnessing a shift from more formalized urban planning expertise to new formats of experimental knowledge making in which there is an intention to learn from organized interventions often with the active participation of lay publics. I will describe the development of urban agriculture in London as grounded in three overlapping configurations of political learning. Each of these configurations can be understood as a very specific nexus of social practices, of ways of doing practical things together, ways of reasoning and talking, ways of formulating and contesting political claims. Engagement in these practices can be described as political learning if it not simply reproduces established routines and understanding, but if it opens up new fields of politically relevant knowledge and imagination. This can happen in formally organized experiments, such as described by her and Carvonen, but also more spontaneously as with the food growing projects that I'm going to describe here.
My lecture is based on still ongoing research on urban agriculture in London. I have collected published historical documents, grey literature from policy institutions and NGOs, and I conducted interviews with some key actors. The structure of my lecture follows the historical sequence in which these three different configurations of political learning in agriculture have evolved historically. The first was the engagement in community projects of gardening and farming, which already started in the 1970s. The second configuration was the planning-oriented research pursued by a new set of food planning experts. And the last was a sponsoring campaign through which, before the London Olympics in 2012, the Greater London Authority tried to mobilize Londoners to grow their own food. So the first configuration can be called project activism. The roots of this configuration can be traced back to the early 1970s, when the first city farms and community gardens were founded in London. These were community projects in which local people came together to engage in gardening and food growing, and in the case of city farming, also to keep livestock such as cows, pigs and chickens. They made use of vacant lots that for some reason had remained untouched by urban development. Kentish Town City Farm was established in 1971 on a former railway stable. Five years later, a local sculpturist initiated a garden project in the wasteland between Great Union Kennel and uh, the, adjacent, uh, the, the adjacent railway line and a motorway. And what later became known as Cable State Community Garden emerged in 1978 on a lot that had been cleared to create space for a housing estate, which, however, was never built. Another community garden called Culpepper was established in 1982 on a bombed site, which somehow had remained unbuilt since the end of the war. Some of these projects started as illegal squats but in the long run, they reached agreements with the responsible authorities. In 2014, 63 such projects in London have been registered by the UK Federation of City Farms and Community Gardens, but the real number was obviously higher since not all projects were formally registered. Rather than implementing a pre-given template, these projects took shape in an open process in which site-specific experimentation and the circulation of skills and knowledge mutually reinforced each other. Learning and sharing knowledge covered almost all dimensions of setting up and running gardening projects. It was about how to find an apt site for the project, how to mobilize and organize a group that would work together on its re uh, realization, or about how to convince administration officials to support the project. Also, what a city farm or a community garden actually should be. How the sites should be designed and maintained for this purpose was a matter of site-specific innovation and experimentation. Once gardens and city farms were established, they, they became important knowledge resources for other projects. Knowing about how such gardens Knowing about such gardens was not only motivated uh, for, was not only a motivation for other people so that they could follow their example and also emulate techniques and practices that earlier projects had developed. For example, with Kentish town city farms, the, uh, the founders regarded their project really as a model farm that should instigate followers and help them manage their own projects. They promoted their experiences and presentations and publications and invited visitors to learn directly from the presence on their farm. Food growing has not always been the exclusive goal of community gardens. They also included ornamental beds and areas for outdoor sociability. And the city farms held animals for educational purposes, not for food production. It was early in 1990s that such initiatives defined themselves more explicitly as food-growing projects. Some gardens became even part of larger food-growing networks, such as growing communities, a charity in East London. 
Founded in 1996, it has launched various initiatives to locally produce and market alternative sustainable food. Since 1996, Common Growth had established four community gardens and parks in which it engages volunteers in food growing. Unlike in most earlier community gardens, where the participants consumed their own harvest, the produce is marketed via vegetable boxes and a salad selling scheme. Another initiative, the Veg Street project in Islington, integrated the private front gardens of the residents in a collective food growing project, as you can see here on the side. So on the slide. Uh, the initiator of the project did not only provide food growing advice to her neighbors, but she also experimented with different planting techniques and really wrote a book that was meant to guide further activities of community food growing. A more recent innovation was the emergence of mobile gardening projects, which grew vegetables in planting boxes, which can be easily moved to other spaces. This is a creative attempt to accommodate the growing interest in community food growing with the realities of the global city, in which soaring real estate prices and investment activities caused much pressure on London's open spaces. This has made it increasingly more difficult to find spaces for food growing, but mobile gardens managed to seize space for interim use for which construction projects were already planned. Since the 1990s, project activism became complemented by a second configuration of political learning, planning-oriented research. This research domain took shape in an international network of experts of diverse backgrounds, such as geography, health sciences, urban planning, or architecture. So in 1992, urban ecologist Herbert Girardet had already estimated that cities covered only 2% of the Earth's surface, but consumed 75% of its resources. From a public health perspective, urban patterns of food consumptions, which tended to include a lot of fat, sugar, and dairy products, were blamed for causing diseases, including a rising obesity crisis. These discourses did not only lead to a reconceptualization of cities as so-called urban food systems, but also to attempts to change this food system towards a more sustainable alternative. In line with a general call for regional, seasonal, organic, and health-oriented food supply, this led to the advocacy of food growing within and in the close vicinity of cities. In contrast to the project activism, which promoted food growing primarily as a form of urban community sociability, the focus shifted now to the actual productivity of urban agriculture, which these food planners also valued in very abstract and quantitative terms. In London, the food planning uh, charity Sustain acted as an important mediator of such a process of knowledge making. How this learning worked can be best illustrated by the example of one path-breaking report that Sustain has published in 1909. The report was titled City Harvest, the Feasibility of Growing More Food in London. And it was authored by Tara Garnett, a graduate of development studies, who was working as a freelancer for Sustain. In her report, she summarized the results of a two-year survey of London's food growing activity. Garnet relied on administrative data and reports, for example, from the food retail sector, waste management, public health, social equality, but also on her own observations of dominant food habits in London. And on this basis, she sketched a picture of London's food system as profoundly unsustainable. Another focus of the project was the stock taking and evaluation of food growing activities in London, which constructed urban agriculture as a coherent field of policy knowledge. Urban agriculture was thereby used as a broad umbrella category that encompassed, quote, the production of all manner of foodstuffs, including fruit and vegetable growing, livestock rearing and beekeeping, at all levels, from commercial horticulture to community projects to small-scale hobby gardening, unquote. 
Garnett declared it impossible to assess with any degree of accuracy, as he said, how much London produced at the time of the survey. However, she used earlier research by the Royal Horticultural Society on the productivity of allotment plots to venture at least some rough estimates. Accordingly, London could produce 232,000 tons of food and vegetables if all other potentially suitable open spaces, such as derelict areas, parks, or gardens, were also used for this purpose. Considering the recommendations of the World Health Organization, this would equal 18% of the necessary daily intake of each Londoner. As, Garden, as Garnet claimed, London could become a pioneer of urban agriculture for, uh, for the UK and even for Europe, if adequate policy measures were taken. Accordingly, the inner city area would be used as much as possible for the intensive and small-scale production of food and vegetables. The green belt and its further surroundings of the city would host sustainable agriculture enterprises producing grains and potatoes, and then an outer circle would be formed by the importation of fair trade overseas products such as rice, coffee and bananas, which is still uh, give a place in the urban food system. City Harvest provides a good example of the creative tinkering with a variety of sources through which planning knowledge of urban agriculture took shape. Her research involved managers and representatives of voluntary and public organization in one borough. These partners did not only provide data for the study, but also learned about the project and presumably also developed a commitment for its political mission. To feed its ideas into broader public debate, the working group also organized the City Harvest Festival in the borough of Tower Hamlet. When in 2006, the Greater London Authority presented a food strategy, it also embraced food growing. In the following years, many of the London boroughs developed their own food strategies. Although none of these programs lived up to these ambitions that Garnet had articulated in her report, this was clearly an effect of such knowledge making by food planners. So let me now come to the third configuration of political learning, which is a semi-governmental semi sponsoring campaign. The so-called Capital Growth Campaign drew its inspiration from Toronto, where the city had pledged to create 2010 growing spaces to compensate for the environmental impact of the Olympic Winter Games in 2010. When Sustain critically reviewed the London plans for the Olympics in 2012, it suggested a similar campaign for London. The idea was embraced by London's new food advisor, Rosie Boycott, and during the London Food Conference in 2008, Mayor Boris Johnson announced his support. Boris Johnson, he was a major back then in London. And already his predecessor, the Labour Mayor, Ken Livingston, had already committed himself to making the London Olympics a landmark example of sustainable event planning, a goal that was also embraced by his conservative follower, with the emphasis on communities and citizens, the capital growth campaign also chimed well with Johnson's neoliberal agenda of individual responsibility taking and community mobilization. The actual planning and management of the campaign was in the hands of London Food Links, which was a partnership network run by Sustain. Through publicity work and in some phases also the provision of small starting grants, Capital Growth succeeded to instigate 2012 new community-based growing projects in London. Its managers facilitated community growers with skills and materials and lobbied for the support of food growing by public authorities and housing corporations. As such, Capital Growth has continued its work after the Olympics. So how did collective learning form part of this campaign? On the one hand, this happened through the active role of the campaign managers as knowledge brokers who pooled existing knowledge about food growing and communicated it back to the participating growers. 
On the other hand, campaign managers also monitor the food growing spaces and their activities, and on this basis generated new knowledge about growing. In the beginning of the project, campaigners maintained direct uh, contact with the growing projects through site visits. They provided the projects with personal advice and familiarized themselves with their work and the problems that they faced. When the number of projects grew, direct site visits became too time consuming for the managers and they delegated this task to volunteer site inspectors who were supposed to ask a certain set of predefined questions. Although the use of online questionnaires uh, was uh, introduced later, the, the use of online con uh, questionnaires, and through this Capital Growth then inquired regularly about its projects concerning, for example, their membership, the size, but also the kind of activities that they engaged in. For example, the survey established that food growing spaces amounted to approximately 500,000 square meters, which the authors compared to the size of 69 Wembley football pitches. So it's really a lot. Capital Growth used this to underline the success of its campaign, but also to identify problems and to draw lessons that would make future uh, food growing campaigning more effective. The organization of the campaign as a race for a quantitative goal 2012 growing spaces in 2012 implied that counting such spaces and making their numbers publicly visible became itself a knowledge practice of profound political significance. Depending on when, on when they joined, these projects were represented through their running number, which was sometimes also shown as a signpost at the entrance of the gardens. Capital Growth indicated the actual count of growing spaces on its website. Far from being only descriptive of the increase in growing activities, this consecutive numbering constructed a sense of collective commitment and excitement. We, we, are, we are getting more and more, and thereby it connected the individuals to a larger public mission. Within the capital growth campaign, urban agriculture has left the niches of community activism and expertise and has entered the agenda of official urban policy. This new configuration, however, implied a fundamental change of the terms under which learning and experimentation on urban agriculture occurred. Rather than being self-directed project experimenters, as in project activism, the growers were now mobilized for a knowledge process that was beyond their own control. It required that they accepted certain rules of the game, which were defined by the managers of the campaign. For example, how they defined a food growing project, or how they managed the flow of information from the projects. While capital growth was the result of earlier project activism and food planning expertise, without this former development, it would have never taken place. However, one should not overestimate the transformative capacities of such political learning. First, the success of the campaign hinged on the mobilization for a focusing event, the 2012 Growing Spaces for the 2012 Olympics. And although Capital Growth has launched a follow-up campaign, it has never received the same momentum. Third, it represented a relatively limited form of promoting food growing. There existed more far-reaching proposals to transform London into a seamless space of food growing, a continuous productive landscape, as the architects Boom and Bayoun have called it. This, however, would have required a forceful restriction of the capital-driven logic of urban development, for example, through statutory planning schemes. Campaigning, by contrast, restricted political learning and imagination to the mobilization of citizens and communities. It could thus only lead to experiment in those few interstices of the urban landscape, which somehow had remained untouched by the real estate market. It is an open question if these small-scale activities can also become springboards for a more far-reaching politics of transformation. Let me end this chapter with a brief conclusion. 
First of all, it shows uh, as the transformation is not a self-evident consequences of the objective pressure of global environmental challenges, as Beck sometimes seems to suggest. I have shown that the development of urban agriculture was driven by three interrelated processes of constructive learning to which Londoners came to see their city and its problem in a new light and to which they developed new capacities of collective action. It was the experimentation of cities and community gardens and city farms which shaped the very practices and understandings that became the template for community-based urban agriculture. Subsequently, the collaborative research of food planning experts framed these activities within the broader picture of an urban food system and a systematic scenario of urban transformation. And finally, the sponsoring through capital growth configured the planter as an object of semi-governmental learning and experimentation. All the learning processes in these configurations followed quite different logics and priorities. They also overlapped and mutually enforced each other. Together, they led to new understandings of what constitutes the city, how its components function, and thereby they opened up new political spaces for claims making and imagination. That cities are food systems, that growing food can reduce the ecological footprint and that public authorities should play an active role in the promotion of such activities have become widely shared assumptions of political discourse. It is another question, however, to which extent such learning and the knowledge acquired in these processes will materialize in tangible shifts of the institutional and, of institutional and material transformation. Even if London has become a vivid center of urban agriculture initiatives, this has merely resulted in significant changes within the city, but it has barely brought about a change of the city at large. Cities London city, London in general, the fundamental logic of food provisioning there and capital-driven land use, they have evidently remained in place. It is even unlikely that broader changes could be brought about only through the further mobilization of activities within urban agriculture. If such broader changes of transformation will occur, they will most likely emerge from the synergetic convergence, convergence of these urban food growing activities with other agendas of socio-ecological change and from forging public coalitions around them. Thank you very much for your attention. Good evening. The time is 6 o'clock, and this is Singapore Today with Jing Yi, broadcasting live on CNA 938. Tonight's headlines. The government has called for calm following climate fluctuations and extreme weather, which has resulted in widespread crop failure across Asia and Europe. An initiative to weatherproof HDB flats is being fast-tracked by the Ministry for Climate Response after forecasters warn of the increasing likelihood of a tropical cyclone hitting Singapore. The Northumbrian Liberation Front has claimed responsibility for yesterday's coordinated attacks in London, England, which left 13 dead and many more critically injured. Food supply chains are facing a prolonged period of disruption after a series of extreme weather events hit harvests in much of Asia and Europe. Droughts and flooding associated with this year's El Nino event have devastated crop yields, leaving farmers financially vulnerable, livestock short of feed and supermarket shelves empty. Following a statement by the chair of the UN Food Programme warning of expected price rises of staple foods, the Prime Minister announced a raft of new measures to bolster national and regional food security 
with additional funding for Singaporean research labs and the Malaysian agricultural sector. These proposals also provide new incentives for the development and rollout of fortified GM crop varieties and a renewed push to mainstream indoor farming initiatives in Singapore. Leading researchers have warned of a growing risk of tropical cyclones in Southeast Asia, an event once considered impossible. With the global drop in carbon emissions in 2014, it was assumed that the crucial tipping point had been avoided.